Okay. Hi, everyone, and good evening or good afternoon if you're in Perth. <laughs> Thank you for taking your time to join our live webinar today. My name is Grace, and I'll look after um, BenQ LCD monitors, and I'll be your co-host in this live webinar with our main star of the afternoon evening, Alex, and also her little, little dog in the background, as you guys can see. <laughs> um, we are delighted to have one of our master photographers with the Australian Institute of Professional Photography, AIPP, winner of countless awards, and also our BenQ Global Ambassador. Uh, she, Alex also has the Order of Australia Medal, and she will be hopes, helping us host this live webinar today. Alex's point of view is set squarely on the animal kingdom. She creates remarkable portraits um, of around 1,300 animals per year, from dogs, cats, reptiles, rats, rabbits, ferrets, birds, horses, goats, sheep, to bilbies, penguins, possums, monkeys, bears, tigers, elephants, and the much beloved quokka from her home state in Western Australia. With 12 years dedication to professional animal, animal photography, she is an undisputed leader in her niche. Now, Alex will go through some topics today with um, animal photography with reference to pet and wildlife work, showcasing some studio and natural light work with some great examples on animals, and also the importance of color accuracy and management, and a short editing section factored in with experience um, using our photography monitors. There will also be a short Q&A session at the end, so feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar and we'll get back to you at the end um, of the session. Also at the end, there will be a quick survey so if you could please provide some of your feedback, that would be greatly appreciated and would also help us for the future webinars. We'll also include some links in the chat for you to find out more information. Otherwise, if you miss this webinar, it is also recorded as well. Or if you have, um, if you know anyone like your friends or fellow photographers, if they can't join today, it'll also be recorded as well. Um, so now over to Alex, if she can share her screen. Sure. It's just answering. Someone was having a problem with sound. So I was just saying, just check your volume. Volume is turned up so you can hear us okay. Yep. And I'm just going to share screen. So I'll stop sharing. And, and it's big and it's going. Okay. Is that nice? that first slide uh, on there, everyone can see. Okay, I'm just going to the chat. Yep, you can see the slide, awesome, great. Uh, thank you very much, brilliant. Okay, let's go. So thank you all for staying up late, getting up early, rolling out of bed at four o'clock in the afternoon to join us on this live webinar. Got a lot to run through. If you see anyone bouncing around in the background, it's Marshmallow, the special needs puppy. And like Grace and I were discussing, if you hear any strange noises, it's also Marshmallow, the special needs puppy. Even if it is me, she's going to get the blame. So that's uh, that's the story. And I'm going to go with it. And I'm just going to work out how to get my screen to move. Firstly, thanks to BenQ for hosting us today and for giving me this opportunity to speak to you all. I'm really excited to share with you some cute animal photos and talk about what I love. Firstly about me, what I love. That sounded really narcissistic. Uh, funny that this slide comes up first. I actually love animal photography, but I thought I should give you a quick intro to like get onto the stuff that I love. So I'll start with a little bit about me. Um, I have three pets. Macy, great big fat black and white cat. Marshmallow in the middle, as you can see, she's a little bit wonky uh, in more ways than one. Love her to bits. And Pip, our Kelpie. They are 11 years old, one year old and nine years old. And Marshy in the middle is the one that's running around in the background making all the noise. A lot of people ask me, why did I choose animals? And my answer is they chose me. Firstly, why wouldn't you photograph animals? They're one of the most amazing subjects you can get. And there's just so much joy involved in working with animals. And it's always different and it's always varied. And they're just a subject matter that I stuck to really early on. And I never wanted to photograph anything else. And to this day, probably been about 16 years since I bought my first camera. I still don't want to photograph anything else. Through my photography, I have two main aims. The first one is to showcase the beauty of animals through images. So my images are always positive and always showing animals in a good light. Nothing graphic or scary, 
I want people to see that animal and go, wow, that's so beautiful. And then maybe go, oh, and she's only got three legs or an eye missing, or, you know, there's maybe some sort of difference about her or him. So I always lead with that first and foremost. And then through my images, I try to support, promote and endorse animal rescue. That's a massive part of who I am as a person, feeling like I should give back to animal charities and just feeling like I should help animals as much as I can through my images. Uh, here's just a quick screen on my statistics, just to um, share a little bit about me with you. I always get uncomfortable reading this stuff. Um, basically, as Grace said, I've, um, I'm an ambassador for BenQ and a number of other brands. Um, I have some, a number of books out. I've won a few awards, including an Order of Australia Award, or Order of Australia Medal for services to animal charities, which I was super proud of, but also a bit uncomfortable about because, you know, if you receive a medal from the government, you've got to make sure that you really live up to that. And it's just driven me to do more animal charity work since. And uh, I'm lucky to work with about 40 animal charity organizations on a regular basis. What I love about photography, there are three main things that I absolutely love. I love that it's magic. To me, it is pure magic. Now I know how a camera works and I wasn't sure if you guys would know. So I've drawn a picture to help you understand. Um, this is the picture I drew. Now this might also explain why I'm a photographer and not an artist, because I'm definitely not an artist. This is a camera, just in case you didn't know. And the light comes in and it goes around the lens and it hits the shutter and there's a, you look through it and there's a button. It's pretty simple. Um, in case that's not quite enough and you want a little bit more technical info, there's also this goes around there and it spins up and down and it hits that. I mean, if that's not magic, that this inanimate box that we pick up and point at a scene is using light and mirrors to capture that scene and not just capture it as it is, but to capture it how we want to convey it. When we each take a photo, we interpret those scenes in our own way. That, I get goosebumps even saying that out loud. That to me is the best magic in the whole world. And we have the ability to do that every time we pick up our camera and take a photo. And if you probably don't remember anything from this presentation at the end, apart from that BenQ screens are great, remember that photography is pure magic. It lets us share our vision with other people through this inanimate device that we pick up and use as a tool. It teaches us to see more and to be present. Before I started photographing, I didn't notice the little things. You know, I might not photograph them even now if they're not animals, but the way that the spider web is shining in the light or the way the bit of bark is hanging on the tree, creating a shadow. You know, just something that I might have overlooked, the tiniest little beetle that before I wouldn't have even given a second glance to. It makes me look for images. It allows us to express our point of view. You know, we hold that camera up. I interpret animals how I want you to see them, which is how their owners normally see them. You know, that positive light looking beautiful and happy. And I can share things that are important to me through my images, that all creatures have worth and value. Even bats, this is a tiny little rescue bat. Even rats and mice. And probably my least favorite creature of all, but it still has a worth and a value, spiders. And this spider was photographed in my studio. My friend Michael brought this spider in for me and he was bringing a number of other creatures in. And he said on the day, by the way, I've got a surprise for you. I said, oh great, I love surprises. I was thinking it was like cake or something. And he said, it's, uh, I've bought cuddles. I said, who's cuddles? And he said, the bird eating spider. This spider was literally as big as my hand. It eats birds. That's how big this spider is. And I was like, whoa, I don't know how I'm going to go with cuddles because I do not like big hairy spiders. You know, cuddles was really um, having a bad day as far as that goes. And because I had the camera in front of me, that is like invisible shield barrier. Even though it's not mentally, there's a separation between me and the subject. If I've got that camera in the way, it's, it's safety. And I leant in to photograph cuddles and he was all spread out like this, all these legs. And he was kind of creepy looking. And I was like, oh, this photo is, you know, I don't know if this shows how beautiful he is. And as I leant in, this big giant leant in over him. He went boop and he pulled all his little legs in because he got scared. And I was like, oh my goodness, even spiders have feelings. And I frightened him. And that's the little picture. And I put that on Facebook and I shared the story. And even other arachnophobic people said, Oh my God, I actually do think he's, I feel kind of sorry for him and he looks a bit cute. So everything has a worth and a value, even cuddles. 
It enables us to tell stories. We can evoke memories through our images. We can share experiences. We can educate and we can speak our truth. This is what I saw at that point in time and how I experienced it. And I love to, you know, think about why we take photos. There hasn't been a single photographer ever who's taken a picture, and I'll use my phone as the, the um, improv device, who's taken a photo and then looked at the photo on their phone and gone or on their computer or on their camera and gone, oh, wow, this is the best photo I've ever taken. And when someone else says, oh, awesome, can I see it? They've gone, no, I can't show you. It's just for me. We take photos to share these things that we experience and see and learn and our points of view. And we need to get our photos out there off these devices and printed on the walls, share them, give them a life and show people what it's like to view things through our eyes. There are some rules with animal photography. Firstly, safety first. Always be aware of where you are, where you're standing. Don't make it your last shot. It better be a really, really good shot if you're about to fall off the cliff as you take it. And even then I can tell you it won't be worth it. So always be super aware. I wear big boots on my feet and I make sure I always know where my feet are because if I'm not paying attention up here, I need to be paying attention you know, with my shoes. Read your subject's body language. Animals will normally give us a warning before they do something. They normally tell us what they're going to do before they do it. We need to be aware of that and ready for it. And trust your instincts. Animals work on a lot of energy and probably who knows how many other kind of um, skill sets or vibes that they have that we don't really pick up on, that we aren't really that aware of. You know, the minute you get that feeling in your stomach, I, I think this animal just gave me a, a side eye and is looking at me a bit strange trust it because if you even think it and then start feeling that kind of nervous energy they'll pick up on that and you'll get bitten or lunged at or attacked so trust your instincts if you need to get out of there get out of there animals don't sit still they're animals and they don't pose they just do whatever they like even working in a studio i have limited control i can use toys and treats to get their attention but in all honesty it's kind of a free-for-all they're doing whatever they want and it's my job to work around that. Take lots of shots and pick the best. The beauty of digital is you can take as many photos as you like. No one needs to know about the blurry ones. You know, if I'm traveling and I take 5,000 photos in a day, I'd be lucky if I pulled out 10 really solid photos that I wanted to keep because I overshoot everything. I photograph that, you know, say it's a, a wombat, that wombat from above, below, sideways, half the face, looking down, you know, in the environment, close-ups, eye shots, feet, I photograph it every single way I can think before I move on to the next subject. So that when I get home, I don't go, oh, I forgot six versions of this wombat that I could have photographed in a different way. And I pick the best from all those pictures that I take. And it's important to learn to critique your work, self-audit. You know, you'll see on social media, people who post 95 photos of the same bird on the same tree, and they're all the same. You know, instead, pick the best two because it tells the same story and it keeps people more engaged when they're looking at your work. So I'm going to move on to now to the seven factors you need to take better animal photographs. These are the seven things that I think you need, their attributes and, and actual physical things that you need to work with animals. And the first one um, is equipment. It's pretty basic. We need gear. We don't have gear. We can't take pictures. We need subjects. We need animals. We need patience, we need to practice, we need anticipation, timing, and safety. And I'm going to cover off on each of these categories and tell you how I work with them to get the photos that I want. So equipment, very first you know, point of call because without a camera, we can't take a picture. I shoot with a Canon 1DX Mark II body or a Sony A9 and various Tamron lenses. Everything I use is Tamron slash Canon in the bodies. I wear a spider holster belt. Uh, that's me in the Galapagos Islands. It saves my neck. It saves having a strap hanging around my neck. I've got my lens pointing down there, but it actually sits facing parallel to the ground and I can kneel down without it hitting anything. I can run with it. I only run if I'm being chased, let's face it. I'm not really a runner, but I can run with it if I need to. There's a little button so you can lock it in so it doesn't come out. It's super handy, especially if you're on boats where you need to be hands-free, things like that. Highly recommend it. If you've got any problems with your neck, back and shoulders, put it on your hip. I have a BenQ monitor. I bought an amazing PC a few years ago. 
uh, it was fantastic. It was like $7,000 computer. I thought I'm going to treat myself. I used this computer hours a day. It was great. It's a Microsoft Surface Pro, but what it didn't do is have good color balance. The colors were wrong. So this picture is slightly green. This one's, you know, a greeny blue. This one's got a purple kind of color cast to it. This one's a bit pink. Uh, I think that might even be the, the accurate version. No, that's it there. The very last one. That's how it actually looked with, when I was there at the time. Kind of a greeny background fading down to blue at the bottom and the flamingo wading through. That's bad though if you're getting that much variation in your prints and your products. You know, if you're, if you're seeing a photo on screen and you're printing it out and it's not coming out how it's meant to look, it's not coming out how you see it on your computer, it's really bad, especially if you're selling those prints to clients. And I started having to reprint stuff because those color casts were coming through. I needed to know that what I saw on screen was what I was going to get when I printed. I had to have that trust in my equipment. So when I see a photo like this, I want it to look like that when it's printed on the cover of a magazine. I want it to exactly replicate the color and the detail and know that it's accurate. So I ended up purchasing my first BenQ monitor. It was an SW241. I uh, just recently upgraded to the two, sorry, 271, uh, upgraded to the 271C, which is amazing. It's 24 inch, a 27 inch, sorry, monitor. And I absolutely love it. It was a game changer for me. So I now do all my editing on my BenQ monitor to make sure the colors are accurate. If you're not using an accurate monitor, you're not seeing everything in your image. You're not getting the depths of the shadows. You're not getting, you know, any variation in the lights and darks. You're not getting true color accuracy and you're just missing contrast and the range of colors that you can see are limited. And in a photo like this, I want it to look as vibrant as it's meant to look. I don't want this to be faded. I don't want it to print out darker than it should be. I want all that beautiful fur texture and detail and I don't want to lose that because my monitor is telling me a lie. And then I realized too, you know, we spend thousands of dollars on cameras and lenses and I probably spend 50% of my time editing photos and 70% on my computer. And yet I hadn't invested in an adequate monitor. I, I invested in an adequate computer, but not in an adequate monitor. So just have a think about that. If you're buying the best gear and the best lenses, you need the best screen to go with it. Things I take when I travel or take photos outdoors, but really use, I take a flash. I only use it occasionally. Normally with animals, I prefer natural light when I'm outdoors. I take a tripod, don't use that very often. Mostly use it for birds in flight or I intend to. And when I photograph them, I pick them up and swing it around. It becomes dangerous. So I don't often use that. And I often take a video camera thinking I'll do lots of video and then realize that I'm very oriented towards photographs and not videos. So moving on to subjects, we need subjects. So in my studio, I photograph all pets and all types of wildlife. I use three main lenses. My go-to lens is the 24 to 70 mil Tamron lens. I use a 90 mil macro for little tiny creatures. And I use a bigger zoom only if I've got things in like venomous snakes, where if I get bitten, I've got 30 minutes before I die. With those ones, I stand right at the back of the room and I use a big zoom. Most of the time I'm using a 24 to 70 up nice and close. And I have a photo in here to show you where I actually sit in relation to the subjects. And I use pro photo lighting, professional lighting to light these animals up, make them look beautiful under the light. My settings in the studio do not change. Because I'm in a studio, it's a controlled environment. The light is always the same. So I don't alter my settings. F13, ISO 100 and 1 to 100 for the second. Every time I turn my light on and, you know, make my light brighter or, or darker, I can kind of control that. I keep the same settings. I just bring the light forward if I need more light and I drag it back if I need less light or I turn it up for brighter, down for darker. My settings stay the same. I photograph little feathered friends, larger feathered friends, rainbow colored friends, cats with different colored eyes, Cats yawning, who look like they're laughing. Kind of hard to get a smiling photo of a cat. It's probably the only one I've ever got. Uh, it's really difficult. Dogs will open their mouths and pant and actually probably smile. And cats just look at you like, who are you and why did I have to go in the car? Cats with mood. This is a sphinx cat, so it doesn't have any fur. And I entered this into a competition once and there was live judging. I could hear the judges' comments. And one of the judges said, this cat doesn't have any skin. And I thought, oops, no, it's definitely got skin, just doesn't have any fur on the skin. So this is a fur-free cat, not a skinless cat. 
It's a totally different thing. I photograph small puppies who are happy, big dogs who are happy. Dogs doing a grin. This reminds me of when you say to kids, show me your photo smile and they go, and you're like, oh, okay, just don't, don't do that. Just do normal smile. <laughs> this is a very elderly Great Dane. Puppies sleeping. Puppies who are awake. Looks like soon to be asleep. A few of them are about to fall asleep. Black dogs on black. I saw someone in one of the, the notes we asked them what you'd like to talk about. Said, how do you photograph black animals? It's the, all about the light. You just need a lot of light. You get your light and you pull it forward to you know, light your subject more, or you turn it up brighter. You put them in front of a window. You need good light to light enough of that fur to be able to see their shape really clearly. I photograph tiniest insects using my macro lens for these, to little lizards, to snakes. Sorry for any people who have the snake phobia. Wildlife. I love photographing Australian wildlife. A lot of the, all the wildlife shots in this presentation are rescue animals. So baby Tasmanian devil, two baby koalas, five koalas hugging. These guys were moving along like a little, like a caterpillar, like a little koala, we call it koala train, like they're moving along in a little train. And as they went past, I said, babies, babies. And they stopped and looked and all of a sudden I got the shot of the five of them having a hug. Kangaroo joeys, joey with little splints on his legs. Wombats, crazy. This little guy was the size of a football. And this is my setup in the studio. So I'm basically sitting really close to my subjects. You can see there I'm only about this far away. The light is behind me kind of at the back of my head. You can't see my other hand, but I've got a treat. I shoot with one hand and I've got a treat in the other hand. So I'm like holding the camera, probably about to take the shot and then I'm waving the treat around. And this is just yoga floor matting I've got there on the sides, just like foam rubber matting. And I've got a bit of that at the back with some stretch fabric glued to it. And every single photo you see of mine that's shot on a black background, apart from some with six dogs where I need more space, is photographed in that little tiny metre square, three foot by three foot box. That's it. I can fit probably three or four dogs in there, uh, the same size as this dog. They just kind of find their space. And I normally have the owner standing right um, to the left there of the screen, down in the bottom corner next to the dog. So the owner's just standing there, hands by their sides, waiting while I take the photo and not touching anything and not uh, you know interfering or talking to the dog at all. So I have quite a big studio room. You can see it's, that's probably about a third of it. I just use the tiny, tiny little corner. But that's enabled me to shoot anywhere all over the world. Um, when I photograph on the white backdrop, I roll that right out. It's a great big piece of paper and that gives me a lot more room and I'm further back for that. I, I stand back and sit back a lot further. But for the black stuff, I'm very close. Natural light, again, I photograph mostly wildlife outside. I don't photograph domestic pets outside. I use these three lenses mostly and probably a good majority of these images were taken with the 150 to 600 mil lens. Great big zoom. For wildlife, I like zoom. I want to be a good distance away and get a lot of zoom. I also, on the Sony A9, use these two Tamron lenses and they've just bought out a 150 to 500 mil zoom lens. Uh, it's literally coming out next month, which is going to be amazing. So that will now be my go-to lens on the Sony A9. I'm loving the Sony camera, probably even more than the Canon camera at the moment. Um, I haven't used the Sony in the studio yet, just because the, the Canon is my studio camera but I've been using my Sony camera for all my wildlife stuff for a little while now. So my settings outdoors are very different to in the studio because the environment's different. It's changing all the time. The light is changing, the animals are moving in a, a broader area. I have less control. So I shoot on A or AV mode, depending on what camera body you're using. And I use the lowest f-stop of that lens generally. Generally, if it's 2.8, I'll shoot at 2.8. And I only adjust my ISO up and down. The camera does my shutter speed automatically. And I sometimes use auto ISO. I used to think that was a bit of a no-no, but now I found out that quite a few pro photographers use auto ISO. And it's a bit of a game changer. Instead of me having to think about it, my camera does some of the thinking. So I flip between that and manual ISO adjustment. And sometimes I adjust my exposure compensation. Uh, if, I, if my subject's quite dark, but the light is quite bright, I might you know, increase the exposure so I get a bit of fur detail in that dark fur. 
And these are just a few examples of my outdoor wildlife work. This was photographed in an area where it was so dark that when I took this shot, I was quite a distance away. I didn't realize until I'd flown home, um, I was overseas, that I had this photo of the baby sucking its thumb. Baby macaque reaching out. This was a 70 to 200 mil zoom. And I was, so was a fair way away and I zoomed right in, but as soon as the baby reached, I got out of there because if the mum had turned and seen the baby reaching for me, you know, the, sometimes wild macaques can be a bit unpredictable. So I got out of the way. Uh, in India, I felt like I was being watched and I turned around and I saw this little guy peering over the monkey temple. This was an old abandoned temple full of monkeys. It was a photographer's dream. Our guide couldn't understand why we wanted to go to the monkey temple. And we got there and everyone was so excited. All we'd seen so far in India were um, you know, basically pigeons at that point, a few pigeons in the city. He took us to the monkey temple and he's like, oh, now I see why you want to come here. They're all so excited. And I said, yeah, that, this is what we wanted. He's like, okay, I don't know why you'd want to photograph monkeys. Rescue but captive tiger. Little penguin in the Antarctic. Penguin in a blizzard. Looks like he's levitating. He's sitting on snow blowing around. Gnarled feet. Antarctic's freezing. When I went there in, it was uh, early February, the snow had melted, but it was, the ground was cold. Just the feather and fur, no, feather, fur, I'm thinking of saying fur. The uh, feather detail is quite amazing. Just beautiful. And by using that big zoom, there were 5,000 pairs of breeding penguins at this location in the Antarctic. I was able to pick and choose the feet or the faces or, you know, a whole cluster of, of penguins. Uh, this is shot in the Galapagos. This is one of the images I'll go through the editing of at the end of the session. This is also in the Galapagos. I'll go through the editing of this one as well. Again, I was probably about, got to be legally six metres away from these guys. I was probably about 10 metres away just to be super safe. Uh, on our boat in the Galapagos, this guy came and landed on our navigation gear. And we're in the middle of nowhere, miles from anywhere, um, is a, a frigate bird. So again, got a great picture just standing right underneath him. We're now in Tanzania, an ostrich, an African elephant, bull elephant, and a quokka. Those of you who don't know, quokkas are small marsupials, kind of like a kangaroo that live off the coast of Perth in Western Australia, where I'm based. And they're known as the happiest animals on earth. Uh, on the island they live on, they have amazing beaches, they don't have any predators, probably why they're so happy, and when you go there, because they're so used to people and they're not scared of anything, they run up to you like they know you, and you're like, oh, I've never had wildlife, technically they're, they're wild animals, run up to me and be like, hello, <laughs> take my photo. So they're super cute, they're very sweet, and they're always eating and sleeping, which is probably why they're so happy. Um, you know, I tried that lifestyle for a while and made me semi-happy, but I needed a few more things in there as well, like taking photos. And this is uh, not a person who's fallen down and died on the lawn. This is actually a picture of me trying to photograph these quokkas for my last book. And I was using my Canon camera that doesn't have a flip screen on the back. So I was having to try and lay down and, you know, really look through the viewfinder on a really sharp angle with my neck. And it just wasn't working. I thought, this is just too hard. These guys are so small, low to the ground. I'm too old to be getting up and down on the ground like this. You know, um, it looks like there I've collapsed. Um, earlier in the day, this is what I was going through. I had elbow pads on because I was commando crawling through the sticks and the ants. And I was trying to get level with their faces to get those face shots. But again, the, the view, looking through the viewfinder, like it's just, it was so painful. And I'm covered in ant bites, had scratches everywhere. So that's what made me go and invest in the Sony A9. And now I just do this there's a flip screen so you can just point the camera at your subject and look through the screen it's much easier and now I don't have to lay on the ground and roll around and get bitten by anything don't overlook easy subjects where do you find animals don't overlook crabs at the beach you know if you walk along a beach you won't see anything but if you sit on a beach everything comes out and there's creatures everywhere the little crabs get used to and they come out farm animals you know, farm animals are great subjects. They're normally pretty used to people, horses. Um, you know, there might have been someone that has a pet pig or some chickens. Go and take their photo. Those of you who are overseas or if you travel overseas, eventually when we can, when our borders open again. Squirrels. This one was in Central Park. You know, Australians, you can spot Australians in America because they're obsessed with the squirrels, <laughs> photographing the squirrels. But urban wildlife, you know, even the pigeons in India when we were in the city before we got to the monkey temple were a great source of subject matter for our photos. 
little reptiles, little skinks and lizards, even around your house. We've got some that live on our letterbox, you know, um, insects, snails, butterflies, ducks, ducks and birds at the local park, really accessible, agreeable animals and not forgetting domestic pets, your own dogs and cats, your own furry friends, take your dog to the park, throw the ball and do a burst of photos as they jump for it. So don't overlook easy subjects. Seagulls are great to plat green and practice birds in flight, really easy subjects. And this is myself and my friend Kath in the pool and my friend Kelly in the front. And a dragonfly landed in the pool on the edge. You can see it's up on that little ledge there. So Kath and I got our cameras and we I jumped in with my clothes on. And uh, we said to everyone, don't, you know, don't jump in and splash us. We want to get a picture of the dragonfly. And Kelly thinks we're mad. She's like, they're crazy. What are they doing? But when everyone saw the photo, they were like, oh, I wish we jumped in the pool with our cameras and got a photo of the dragonfly. So that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to angle the shot so the background was pretty clean and white, bright and get the picture of the dragonfly. You need patience to photograph animals. You need time patience and image patience. You know, sometimes you've got to sit and wait and sometimes you've got to take a lot of shots. And patience was something I had to learn in the beginning. If I was photographing dogs, you know, and the dog was really naughty in the studio, I'd be thinking, oh, far out, I'm not getting enough shots. This is going really wrong. You know, the owner's going to be disappointed. And then I realized that in thinking that, that's the energy I was putting out, that dog would play up more and become more difficult. So I had to let that go and just go, you know what, I'll get what I need. It's always going to be okay because animals feed off our energy. The owners couldn't pick it up, but the dog could. So when I was in Tanzania, I was leading a photo tour there in 2009. And in our hotel was a big mound of rocks and these little things called uh, rock hyraxes or rock dassies live in there. They're like we were joking calling them guinea pigs, but they're not guinea pigs. Like little the guinea pig size and they grow to quite large. They start off small. And I'd been in the pool. Uh, it was the end of the day. We'd done our safari and we're in the swimming pool. And I'd had a few margaritas. Now I don't drink very often. When I do, I drink margaritas. Uh, they were quite watered down margaritas, but I had had a couple of them. And I walked out of the pool back to the hotel room. And as I did, I saw these two baby rock dassies sitting out on the mound of rocks with all the other bigger rock dassies. And I was like, wow, they're so cute. They're like this big, have to go and get my camera. Our room was the furthest one away out in the wilderness pretty much where there was wild elephants roaming around. So I ran down there very carefully not to fall over because I had the margaritas. I came back, I was still in my bathers, all had shorts on and I was soaking wet. And I sat down and I started photographing. And I was probably, had a big lens, I was probably about four or five meters from these guys. And I was trying really hard not to get blurry photos because I had had a couple of margaritas. I was a bit worried about, you know, don't, want, don't make these photos blurry. And I sat there and sat there and just shot and shot and shot. Next thing, another baby turned up. There were three babies. And I was like, wow, hold your breath. Don't, you know, make these blurry. Got to get these shots. Because next minute, another baby turned up. I'm like, oh my goodness, now there's four. Oh, well, I run in the pool, you know, and you can see this one actually is a tiny bit blurry. <laughs> Because it's like so excited, like everything's got you know, happening all at once. Next minute, there were five. I'm like, there's one at the top. Oh my goodness, I can't believe it. They just kept coming out. I sat there and sat there and shot, and then there were six. I was like, far out, when will this end? How many baby rock dassies are living here? And then I got the shot that was the hero shot for me. There were seven, and I couldn't believe it. I got seven rock dassies. Then a bird flew over and they all ran away. I had sat and I'd waited and waited and waited. I ran to the pool carefully with my camera and everyone was in the pool doing the Nutbush City Limits dance. I don't really know why. And I said, look, look at this, look what I got. And everyone went, no way. And they all jumped out of the pool, ran and got their cameras and of course ran to the rock pile and the rock dassies were gone. Now, when you go on a photo tour, you all get very similar photos because you're shooting side by side. And it's great fun to, to shoot with your friends and point out pictures and get them together. But no one has anything different. And at the end of the trip, we had to vote on best photo on the tour. And everyone very kindly voted for this because it was the only photo that no one else had. I was the only one that got it. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll take that. But just, I had to sit there for a long time and I had to wait and I had to take a lot of shots and keep shooting. You need practice. You have to practice taking photos. If at first you don't succeed, try and try again. You can always hone your angles and composition. Always keep practicing and experimenting. Getting the shot, takes a little bit of time. You have those friends that post something like this on Facebook and go, oh, this was so great. Look at this, I love this, this day. And you're like, when the log floated down the river, I don't really know what's going on. 
if they just watched and waited, it's actually an elephant rolling around in the pond. Well, it has to come out at some point. So this is the same elephant like a minute later coming out and she did a big spray of water. And that's the photo that I chose to put on social media to represent that. Now, the series of photos for this shot, she came out of the water and did the little bubble. Then she did the question mark. And then she did the splash. And I chose the question mark because I just love the shape of that. If I'd put all three photos online, it would have diluted the message. To some people, that all look the same. You know, they'd just be like, this is the same photo three times. Instead, I wanted something that was really different. And practice your angles and composition. Get creative. I love doing stuff. I, I don't want just a zebra's head on my wall. I want something arty that's different to what I normally do. I love cropping things in half, half faces, you know, kind of do. And these are mostly shot in camera. I'm not really editing too much in these. I'll show you kind of how much editing I do do in the editing session. It's not a lot. I try and shoot as much of it as I can in camera. And a close up of a trunk curled up. The mum preening the baby and its little foot sitting up while it's having its preening done. Crocker, Crocker's hands holding the little snack. This is the hand of a macaque monkey, an elderly macaque monkey. It looks almost human. You no, know, like it's amazing. The texture, the fingerprints on the skin, you no, know, the fingers, the fingernail detail. The back of a quokka. You see the quokka's smiling face so often. I thought, what about the back of the quokka's is? Super cute. It's different. People are like, that's a quokka. That's really cool. And in Africa, I got sick of photographing. I didn't get sick of it. I, I wanted different shots. I was getting the, sh the shot of the giraffe over and over again, you know, just standing there. And I was like, I want something different. So I started increasing my f-stop to as much as the lens would go, you know, like f32, and shooting and just pointing my camera down as I shot. You have to do this a lot to get these shots, but it was just practicing and practicing. If you move it too quickly, this whole, this whole um, giraffe would disappear. So I had to do it, time it just right to look like paint running. And this is the picture we actually have in our house printed on a big canvas, because I love it because it's abstract. It's not just the giraffe, it's arty and the grass and everything about it, you know, breathes Africa to me. Like photographing grasses and putting animals behind them. So you know that's a zebra, but it's not really focused on the zebra. It's kind of like really abstract. Imagine that as something big on the wall. And then I got into photographing the predators and blurring out the prey. So this hyena was circling the zebra herd. And I also saw some lions watching elephants. And I was trying to get a cheetah, oh, sorry, leopard one as well, but I, I couldn't get in the right spot. But you know, I got two shots for the series. It was like, great. But, you know, you, you can see that what's going on. It's almost from that animal's point of view, watching that. And in that case, the elephant's not the prey. The elephants were the boss. They came down to the waterhole and all the lions got out and sat and waited. You need to anticipate what's going to happen next. You need to learn behaviours and preempt movements and responses. So it's knowing about animal behaviour and how they're going to react. Two of the most common questions I get asked, how do you get them to sit still and how do you get them to pose? And I kind of covered this off at the start. I don't. I actually just don't. I let them have free reign and it's my job to capture those moments. They can kind of do whatever they want. I work really organically. Whatever they give me, I will get. And that's how I get their true personality because, you know, if the dog is kind of quiet and, you know, not very expressive, that's what you'll get. You can't get anything else out of that animal. If it's a happy dog that's all over people, that's what you'll get. The crazy, happy faces. Same with wildlife. You know, you're looking at a herd of zebra. You can pick the one that's got, that's a bit naughty. And, you know, it's playing up out of everyone. So I look to time it to capture those moments. And it's a team effort between always us and our subjects. These two rabbits eating a bit of grass. Suddenly they got closer and closer. I started thinking what's going to happen next. Got ready. Ooh. Now, if I tried to hold them there, firstly, it's not very nice. Secondly, the more you try and make an animal do something, the more it goes no. You know, I didn't want to stress them out. Then immediately their little faces touched and they pulled their faces away and I got the shot just from eating a piece of grass. This is a juvenile Caspian tern. These are all rescue animals in this little section. And he was being released a few days after the shoot. And I said, this is great, but does he do anything else? I had a hundred photos like this. And they said, oh yeah, if he has, if he sees his lunch, he'll start yelling for, for food. And I said, well, is it his lunch time? They said, yeah, pretty much. He'd probably want his lunch. And they pulled out these little fish and he started yelling for the fish. This is a great educational shot for you know, the rescue group to show people, look, this is you know, how they eat and that's the inside of his mouth. 
this little tiny possum, this log is sitting on a, a white ottoman. It's only about that high, but that possum, I put her on there and she just went, no. And I said, right, pick her up. She looks terrified. That's, we're not going to shoot that. And I got one shot and I was like, oh no, she's not comfortable. I said, what's her favorite thing to make her happy? And they said, oh, she loves sitting in her foster carer's hand. She loves that. I said, let's do that. And there she is sitting in the hand, like the captain of the ship, you know, so super cute. And, and complete, same possum, completely different body language and looks like a completely different animal you know, because she's confident, her ears are up, body language is great and she's really happy. Little tiny sugar glider eating a, a treat, a snack. And if you Google sugar glider photos, studio, white background, you'll see a lot of shots like this. And I wanted something different. And I noticed that he kept running up the foster carer's arm. So we switched to a dark background and I said to his foster carer, next time he runs up your arm, can you very gently just go like that? So he steps down onto the backdrop. I'll get a shot and then he can run back up. Next minute, we switch to black. Max, his name was, Max ran down. The foster carer very gently just turned his hand. So Max put his feet on the ground and straight back up his arm. His feet touched that ottoman that he was sitting on for like a split second. And because we'd planned it, I got that shot. Now this looks like the sugar guy just walked up and put his hand up to say, hold my hand and he's standing there. He isn't, he put his feet down and he went straight back up his arm. Uh, I photographed Max since and I've never got this shot again. So it's a one-off. The shot you miss is the shot you never forget. And I was really lucky that time I got it because I was planning, I was anticipating, he's gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. What's he gonna do next? I'd seen him do it a few times, kind of touch down and run back up. An echidna. Echidnas are quite hard to shoot. They've got very low eyes. You've got to try and get a catch light in their eye. And, you know, they're pretty friendly creatures you know, to work with, but they're just difficult. You know, there's dirt everywhere because they, they've been nesting in leaves and things. And I said, this is great, but, you know, what else can we do? And the echidna carer said, do you know that the echidna's tongue is as long as your forearm? And I said, what? And it fits in that little tiny beak. That can't be true. And she said, yeah, I'll put some food out and you get ready. Anticipate what's going to happen next. So she put a little bit of food out about that far from the echidna and next minute boop, out came the echidna's tongue. Again, a great photo for this rescue to use to show people, you know, in their education sessions about echidnas and the fact that that tongue fits in that little tiny beak. Don't know how. You okay, Marshy? Marshy's choking, but she's fine. She's recovered. <laughs> timing. You need to have good timing. You need to be ready always. Always be ready for what's going to come. You're anticipating it, but unless you push that button at the right time, you're going to miss it. So always be ready. These two dogs were sitting on the couch. Now, I don't use peanut butter or anything on their faces to get them to lick each other or anything like that. I just let them do whatever they want to do. And the little dog was pestering the big dog over and over again. You know, poor big dog's got a new puppy sister and she was driving him nuts. She kept jumping over him and eventually he had enough. And because I was just you know, watching them so carefully, I was anticipating and I was getting ready to get anything that happened as it happened. Suddenly he just went, whoop, and he grabbed her really gently on the face as if like, stop and let her go. And she was like, oh, I just got put in my place. And we got that shot and the owners bought it because they loved it. They're like, that's so, you know, she was being very gentle, but she had to shut the puppy down because the puppy was driving her crazy. Two little pigs just are getting closer. I was like, oh, anticipating, they're getting closer. I'm getting ready, I'm gonna time this. Next thing they note, the little snout's touched. The only time they did that in the whole shoot. <laughs> There's no angry way to say bubbles. The client actually purchased this photo with the quote written on it. Uh, double bubble. I was popping these bubbles as I was photographing this dog and the client said to the dog, oh, you know, I love your bubbles. That's the message to me, stop popping them, get a photo of it. So now I don't do that, I get a photo and I make sure I get a few shots with bubbles then a few shots without bubbles, but a double bubble. It's actually quite hard to get with a dog. And she loved it, she's like, that's so him. You know, that's what he does all the time, he does bubbles. And timing again, we're in Africa, we were driving up to an area where we'd seen lions the day before. Another Jeep was following us and they'd stopped to photograph an elephant. And we pulled up, right as we pulled up, I was ready. I had my camera ready. I could see the line as we were driving up and I was focusing on him while we were moving so that when we stopped, I could get that shot. The minute we stopped, I took the picture and then he dropped down. The other car rolled up. They're like, what are you guys looking at? I said, there's just a lion just there. And they're like, no, there's not. And so they, there's nothing, he was gone. Just crouched down and disappeared. 
but purely because I was anticipating, I had my timing on point, and I got there first, and got the shot. And in the Galapagos, day one on the Galapagos Islands for us was a bit, it was pretty rough weather. And they put us in a little boat and said, we're going to take you to the beach and just let you have a swim. So you get off the, off the main boat, but not for long because the weather's turning. And as we got back on the little boat to go back to the big boat, there was a rocky outcrop in the water and there was this blue footed booby standing on it. And I said, oh, can we stop? I'm going to, let's take some pictures. So everyone took a few photos and I kept shooting and shooting and shooting and shooting. And our guide laughed at me and said, why you take so many photos? You're going to see millions of these birds everywhere. And I said, doesn't matter. There's one here now. You know, I'm going to use this time. I'm getting these shots. And so I'm on a boat that's rocking around and the bird was kind of moving in the wind. So I'm going to get these while I can. That night, a big storm came through. The winds basically scared the birds off for the duration of our trip. We didn't see another single blue-footed booby the whole time we were there. I was the only person that had photos of it because I kept shooting. I won't let anyone shame me about how many photos I take or when I'm taking them. Because again, it took 56 hours to fly the Galapagos Islands. I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to be coming back here anytime soon. I need to make the absolute most of this while I can and photograph everything while it's in front of me. And that's what I did. And I was really lucky to get a shot. And you need safety. You need to do your research, set your rules and have self-awareness. Quite often you have to manage that on your own. You know, even if you're working at a rescue center, they will think that because you're the animal photographer, you know everything about animals and safety. So this is Lucky, a rescue elephant in Cambodia. I'd photographed her a few times, so she knew me. There's three types of elephants at this sanctuary. Ones which are friendly, ones that have hurt people and ones that have killed people. Uh, she was friendly. I also photographed with ones, you know, worked with ones that had hurt people. Um, and luckily got along with them quite well. Um, they're all rescue animals at this sanctuary. And lucky here, I'm crouched down, but she's picking up dirt and throwing it on herself. So I'm in no threat or you know, no danger at all to her. She's quite relaxed. Went back a year later. I'd met her a few times by now. And I was kind of walking in front of her and she'd run up and I'd crouch down and she'd eat trees, run around in the bush. So I thought we were quite good friends. So as we were walking along at one point, I was near her back flank and I was patting her on the leg. And all of a sudden her tail came around and went and hit me in the face. And I was like, oh, that's a weird mistake for an elephant to make. She accidentally hit me in the face. Oh, that's strange. Oh, well, anyway, walked along. I went like that again. She went bang. And I thought, oh, don't do it a third time. She just would have lifted up her foot and booted me into next Tuesday. She was saying, we're not that good of friends. Stop patting me and tell him, give me a boundary. You know, I don't think there would have been a third time lucky, <laughs> even though I was lucky. Um, so I had to get back, you know, I was like, okay, she doesn't like that. Fine to go in front of her and take a picture, but no padding. And free the bears in Laos, uh, they have a, free the bears have a number of sanctuaries, Laos, India, Vietnam, Cambodia. And I uh, photographed for all of them, been to all their sanctuaries a few times. And this was a beautiful bear called Champa. She was the first bear in the world to have brain surgery. She was born with hydrocephalus, so she had fluid on the brain. So when she was born as a baby cub, she had a great big head. And because her head was so heavy, she used to always look down and then she'd lift her eyes up. So she'd look at you like kind of from looking down. And she was about five now. She had surgery when she was about three. And I flew in because um, the CEO of Free the Bears, Matt, had said to me, hey, um, do you want to come and photograph Champa? You can go in with her. I'm like, what, a fully grown moon bear? He said, yeah, you can, like, she's used to people because she's had surgery and you know, she's quite cool with people, so you can go in there. It's like, wow, that's amazing. So I flew to Lau. Um, ironically, the day that I met her, she was having a bad day. And Matt and I went in to see her, and he went to give her some food, and she tried to swipe him and grab him. And he jumped back. I'm right behind him. And he said, she's never behaved like this before in the whole five years I've known her. I was like, oh, dear, I'm about to be in there and take a photo. So that was really good for me to see because, you know, she's a full-grown moon bear. She may be captive, but she's not a pet. She's not necessarily tame. And then Matt said to me, also, just be aware that because she has had this sort of head injury and she's had this brain damage, um, she's actually a bit more unpredictable than the other bears. <laughs> you know, she might think she's hugging you and she's actually snapped you in half. Whereas the other bears will either try and kill you or they won't, but they'll know what they're doing. So I was like, oh no, it just got worse. <laughs> Flying all this way to photograph her. I've got to do my job now. I was also filming for, I think, Today Tonight and a few other little TV things while I was there about this amazing bear. So what I did is I got her food from the pot, I showed it to her, I put it down and I made it very clear that 
you keep it. And I stayed away from her right hand, which is the one that tried to swipe him. So this is me saying, do you want some watermelon? If she didn't throw it back at me, it meant, yes, I'll have it. She liked the bananas and the mango. And we got to be quite good friends. I could literally lay around in front of her, and, but I was always ready to move super quick. You know, here she's looking up because she can hear an aeroplane. Now, this is an old enclosure. We fundraised to build her a new enclosure. To be honest, she liked a small confined space because she felt safe. The big enclosure kind of scared her a little bit. She didn't move out any further than she normally would have. And she used to spend a lot of days laying in an indoor den in her bed. And when I would turn up, she'd hear my voice and she'd come outside and she'd play for like three hours. We'd play soccer. That meant I gave her a ball and she just pitched it back at my head. Um, we played, would you like some banana? Sometimes she'd eat it and say yes. Sometimes she'd throw it at me and say no. And mostly we played Alex, get ready to get out of the way in case she turns on you. But I got all these great photos on it. She was really beautiful. Someone said to me, have a photo with Champa. I said, okay, now, I'm not really into photographing, you know, having a selfie or a picture with the animals I'm shooting. I'm normally just doing my job and not taking any risks. You can see I've turned and the minute I turned, I'm pretty close to her. She's suddenly come up and she's like, who are you and what are you doing? And you can, my face, I'm like, oh, the minute I, I thought, oh, I said, you know what? I'm not gonna have any other photos with her because she's, she's gonna grab me. Like, no, that's gonna upset this whole thing. So I didn't do it. You can tell by my body language, I'm really uncomfortable. And you can tell by her, she's way too curious for my liking. She should be into that food, not even thinking about me and knowing that I'm there. So safety first, you've got to manage it yourself. They, you know, I'm in there with a the bear. She probably stands up taller than me. And then also for Free the Bears, that's my mate, Matt, the CEO. Um, this is in India. This is a compound where the blind bears live. And these are former dancing bears. Free the Bears worked with a group called um, Wildlife SOS in India to get all the dancing bears off the street. Um, so these bears have been taken as cubs. I won't go into the graphic nature of what happens to them, but basically they're fairly humanized and they're made to dance for tourists and, you know, people used to go and give them money. So Free the Bears and Wildlife SOS got a fund together and they purchased um, small business opportunities for the bear owners and they traded in the bears for the business opportunities. And there isn't a single dancing bear now on the streets of India. They're, they're all in this sanctuary and they took a, uh, quite a few of them in. These ones in this enclosure are blind. So there's about six of them. And Matt, the CEO said to me, we've got to go in and take their adoption photos for adoption certificates. I said, sounds great. He said, we're just going to go in there because they're blind, they can't get us. I'm like, well, they've still got legs and you know, sense, you know, a sense of smell. He goes, yeah, but they can't see us. So they won't be able to catch us. <laughs> and I, I believe this stuff, so go in there. When you've got your camera up, you don't have any peripheral vision. So we're photographing the bears. We're meant to be one bear at a time. Matt and I are both photographing this bear. What you can't see in this photo is I'm actually going round and round those sticks in the middle because this bear's chasing me. This bear really knows I'm there and knows where I am. So I'm running round and round and round. Bear's chasing me, kind of a bit freaked out. And that's all good. Run, run, run. And next thing um, I hear a noise and I pull down the camera and there's another bear right next to me, sniffing, going, where is she? Like, where are they? I'm like, oh my God, go, Matt pulls down his camera. I said, Matt, there's two. Like next thing there's three and then four and then five. Now there's six bears in total. And Matt goes, oh no, that where's the keeper? He's run off and left us. He's letting out all the bears. So they're chasing us. And this photo is taken by the people on my tour who think it's great fun. It's like, you know, me running around chased by bears. And anyway, Matt's calling out to the keeper. He's calling and calling him help. <laughs> Come save us from the bears. And the guy comes up and goes, well, I'm, I'm letting all the bears out. I'm helping you. And Matt's like, no, we just wanted one at a time. And then Matt said, where's Chompy? Like, not her proper name, but I can't remember what it was, but it was something like that. Where's Chompy? And I said, who's Chompy? And he goes, well, she's the really aggressive blind bear that tries to kill everyone. Luckily, he didn't let her out. And she can apparently let herself out. So luckily, she didn't hear all the noise and decide to let herself out. So we would have been ripped to shreds. But got the adoption photo, so it ended well. And got a good story out of it, but I don't think next time I'd be quite so keen to go in there <laughs> believing that they're not going to get us. So you need equipment, subjects, patience, practice, anticipation, timing, safety. And now for some extras. Do things go wrong? No, so you don't really need to cover that. Uh, yeah, okay, sometimes they do go wrong. Um, okay, they go often, <laughs> quite go wrong all the time. Working with animals is really unpredictable. Stuff happens all the time. You know, I have a, another presentation called the 15 times I almost nearly kind of not really died. 
because I've nearly been offed by so many animals. Um, I think free the bears alone have tried to kill me about seven times um, by putting me in with bears. There's a lot of different things that have happened. I've nearly been bitten by a, a hedgehog and you can get really bad diseases and die. Like there's been so many things. Um, the grasshopper you saw at the beginning was about this big and was jumping on my eyeball, like literally jumping on my face. And, I, and the grasshopper handler kept taking it off and putting it on the backdrop. And finally I said to him, they can't bite, can they? And he said, oh yeah, they can bite like as big as their mouth is. And this grasshopper's mouth was about this big. And I was like, oh my goodness, that could have taken my whole eye. Could have, like, imagine that, like, I'd be like this and everyone would be like, what were her photos like? And I'd be like, who cares? Did you hear what happened to an eye? Grasshopper ate it. <laughs> Seriously, a grasshopper. So they will go to the toilet on your black backdrop. Now I'm shooting so fast that this just happens. Um, what was even funnier is a friend of mine was sitting behind this pig when the urine touched the little feet, he started kicking it to get it off his feet and it all went over her. Luckily not on me. They will go to the toilet on your white backdrop. Uh, I like to mention that I don't set out to take these type of photos. That's a completely different type of photography that I am not into. But I'm shooting so quickly that the, I thought this greyhound was going to sit. And that like, if you've got a greyhound, you know, that's something to be celebrated. They have lots of muscles on their back legs and they can't sit very easily. So probably only one in 10 will actually sit on command. I thought she was going to do that. And next minute she went to the toilet and she was so embarrassed. And I was like, it's okay, it's okay. Like she felt really bad that she'd done that. But a funny outtake photo. They will show you their butts. I find with animals, I communicate through watching their body language. I can tell you what they're going to do normally before they do it. And I can tell you what they're thinking by the way they're presenting. If an animal does this and shows me their butt, I say to them, that's fine. I'll put that on Facebook and try it. The next minute they turn around. You know, so we don't communicate in the same way, but I believe they understand everything we say, especially when you threaten them with that. They will pull your hair. I had to have some photos taken, some headshots, and someone had a great idea that I should go to the wildlife park and have photos with these great big parrots that can actually snap your finger if you put it in their beak. And they started pulling my hair. Then someone thought, let's add more birds in there and give her another one. So they put another one on. This one just started jumping down on my head and scratching all my head. And when I got home, I had all these bleeding scratches all through my hair. My go-to pose there is just stop. Don't move. Just be still and wait to be saved. That's my, unless it's moving at you at a rate of knots, if anything flapping around or jumping on me, I just keep really still and hope that someone's going to save me. This was my previous car that I had up until late last year. My friend's farm rescue sanctuary. I thought it was really funny because Vinnie the goat was running it up to the car and then jumping up and down on the sunroof. He's bouncing around on the roof. And you can see on the front fender there, this slide marks of his hooves. He was sliding off. So I'd get in it to drive and he'd run in front of it again, jump up onto the, the bonnet and then bounce around on the roof. So I was like, this is crazy. Like this little goat's out of control. Um, little did I realize that when he was sliding off the car, he was scratching through all the layers of paint and he did about $5,000 worth of paintwork damage to the vehicle. <laughs> and then I was out there at the farm sanctuary photographing a behind the scenes video and Vinny came and jumped on me. It took me about two months for my back to feel normal after this because he's very heavy and had very pointy feet. <laughs> and he was just jumping up and down while I was laying on the ground. Um, this is a very blurry photo because it's from a phone, but this was at Brightside Farm Sanctuary in Tassie, an awesome rescue center. I was photographing the pigs and I was leaning against the fence with my camera and all of a sudden I felt a squash. Now this photo is very old. I think I'm using a Canon lens there too. Very squashed. And when I moved my camera away, that pig, 350 kilo pig had parked herself right there. And I remember thinking, what do I do? And she, I was like, excuse me, like, can you move? And she's like, no. And I'm like, all right, I'll just use her as a four-legged tripod. She's not going to move. I'm stuck. I went with it. They'll bite you on the finger. This is my hand. And that's a tiny little rescue leopard cat kitten. It was really sweet. It was like literally like a kitten. And someone threw some chicken in there thinking that would help me get photos. One of the keepers. And it just turned into a hellcat. Look at the claws are out. It was gnashing and biting. When I came out, I did some hand sanitizing and I had hundreds of stinging cuts all over my hands that I couldn't see. And this is a little rescue bear cub called Todd. He was in this little copper log pen and he climbed out. And I said to Matt from Free the Bears, do you want me to pick him up and put him back in? And he said, yep, now you pick them up facing away from you because that way they can't grab you and bite you. They're very solid, probably like a, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier kind of dog density, like they're pretty solid. And lifted him up and put him back in the pen. He was probably about eight months old, maybe a year old. 
and put him in. I climbed back in and he ran up and he hugged my leg and looked up at me. And I thought, oh, he's so grateful that I've put him back in. That's so sweet. And then he opened his mouth and went, and he bit me and ran away. So I've been bitten by um, a bear cub. Um, Didn't even break the skin. So I don't even have a scar to show you, but it makes for a good story. And they will slap you in the face. This was a little rescue joey called Mabel. There were 14 joeys in my studio this day. That's the white backdrop paper. They're all running around in the studio while doing whatever they want. The little guy at the back's waiting for his turn because Mabel has decided that she would constantly slap me in the face, the little hands. And unless you put your hands back and went like that, she wouldn't stop. So I had to put my camera down and go, okay, we'll play a special game to get you to stop hitting me in the face. And this little koala joey, here's my spider holster belt he's sitting on. You can see he's reaching down onto my camera, got my camera hand strap on there. And that's how the spider holster belt holds the camera. It sits back like that. And this was a project spider holster said to me, um, they're an American company. Can you please get some photos of you with wildlife, you know, just showing us, um, you know, your spider holster with some wildlife. I thought, how about a koala joey sitting on there? Great. Got all these, someone's take all the photos, got home and looked at them all. And I went, oh no. You know, Joy's Way Q, the camera looks great, but it looks great. Can't use any of these photos because Koala Joey is grabbing me on the chest. And so I sent them this picture and I said, guys, we can't use this. Grabbing me on the chest, like, can't use that. And they thought it was hilarious and they put it all out over the internet. So <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. She was just holding onto my shirt. And when I went back, I was like, oh no, we can't use this for a promotional photo. What can you do? It's animals. You just got to laugh from it, learn from it. You know, I'll always be aware of where koala joys are holding on next time I ever do a project like that. Animal photography is an awesome way to communicate how you view animals. It's worthwhile, it's fun, and it will bring you joy. And I'm a big believer in if it doesn't make you happy, don't do it. And if it does, do it more, you know, get out there and shoot everything you can. Uh, just quickly mention anyone out there that's a budding pet photographer, I have an eight week program for pet photographers where I basically build you a business that is profitable and has paying clients. So if anyone wants some info on that, please let me know. It's not gonna be a massive plug. I'm just gonna drop it out there. It's normally booked out. Current next intake is uh, July. And I work with people all over the world on that program. It's highly, highly successful. And uh, there's a little link to the website if you'd like more info, or you can message me and I'll send some through blackcatconsulting.com.au. Further, I have a Facebook page, uh, which is for small businesses, um, photographers, you know, um, creatives, and it's a nice little place that you can go. It's called Inspire with Alex Kearns. So if you look that up on Facebook, you can jump in there and I just share business tips and information. It's not photography specific, very tailored to photography, but there's creatives and business owners in there as well. So a little bit different to your standard photography group. Um, on that note, I'm gonna jump into Photoshop and show you guys just some simple editing. I've only got, I'll probably do two photos. Uh, Grace and I have been talking about doing another webinar where we just do, I just show you my, my simple photo editing techniques in greater detail. So we'll probably um, bring that to you in the next few months or so. And in the meantime, I just want to give you a little bit of a taste of what I do when I take a picture. Um, so in Photoshop, I mostly use the crop tool, the clone tool, dodge and burn bit to, you know, um, increase or decrease my contrast, the color tool, coloring in tool, and sharpen. I edit very simply. I try and do things as easily as I can. I'm tech minded as far as I can troubleshoot. You know, if the TV is not working, I can fix it. But as far as in-depth editing or in-depth, you know, things to do with technology, I like to keep it fairly simple and I'm self-taught. So I do things probably in a way that other people wouldn't necessarily do them. These are the tools I use the most, the crop, the coloring in tool, the clone and the dodge and burn. And this has got the, the sharpen menu is in the sharpen is in the filter menu. So I'm just going to um, do a new share and go into Photoshop. Okay, so this is the Galapagos Island lizard picture there. I'm just going to move this menu out of the way. Um, it didn't start out like this. It started out looking like this. So I do try and shoot as close to what I want in my mind's eye as I can. Those blobs in the bottom are other uh, marine iguanas. There were hundreds and this was pre-COVID. This was 2018 and what iguanas do is lay around and they sneeze on each other which is completely unacceptable in today's climate but that's what they're doing. So they're all just sitting around sneezing. 
So I laid down a little distance back. This actual island we were on, I don't know if you guys have seen the David Attenborough footage of all the snakes jumping off the cliffs onto the beach and chasing the lizards. That's the actual island we were shooting on, um, around the back from that. So I was laying on the ground on these, these rocks, trying to make sure there are no black snakes in the cracks because there were kind of a few black snakes around that we'd seen. So I pick what size I want it to be. And this one's fairly simple because this is white sky that I've shot against. You know, and people look at me like, why are you laying down there? I'm like, because I'm trying to isolate this one's face and bring it up to this. So this one's pretty easy. It would literally just be a simple crop. And then I just make sure that, you know, I'm leaving enough of the image. I'm not cropping right in like this where it's going to be blurry because I'm stretching that area back over that big space. I'm just going to do a nice simple crop and it's pretty much there. So, you know, let's see, maybe from that. And that's pretty much done. This is also slightly pasty. It's a bit pale, this image. So I'd go into the burn tool over here. And again, I can do a small brush or a big one for quickness sake, I'll do a big one. It's on 10% exposure. So I'm just darkening some of these areas. You can see it darkening there, 10%. If you can see that you've done it, I'll go to 100% just to show you like, oops, way too much. Like it, it's overdone, I've overcooked it. So just undo that. I want to keep it very minimal so it just looks like it's kind of natural and you know, just darken a few of the areas where there's shadows and creases in the picture. And then it's pretty much good to go. I check for dust spots. Usually I'll have a few because I clean my gear before I go. And then when I'm actually you know, traveling, there'll be dust spots appearing because the camera's got dusty as I've changed the lenses. Um, but that's a pretty, literally what, 30 second quick crop and edit and that one's pretty much done to get it to this point. Take that off where. The picture of the seal laying on the beach, this one, that is the end result. That originally looked like this. So a couple of problems with this. There's a hot spot down here near the face, like there's no detail in there, a little bit here as well. And there's some stuff in the background, some dust spots, and it's on an angle. So first thing I'd do is a crop. I, I wanna crop it to straighten it up. So I just do a simple crop, try and keep as much of the seal in as I can and just try and line it up kind of parallel to the bottom. There we go, so now that's pretty straight. These bits in here, I just grab the coloring in tool and I make the opacity fairly low, 20%. And I select this color, and I just color it over these blobs and bits. And I keep selecting and color, select and color to make sure it blends in really nicely. Get rid of these blobs and bits that are in here. So I just keep doing that. You can see how they're disappearing. And I just keep select, color, select, color. Do that for a while, make sure it's all evened out and blended nicely, make sure there's no banding, so it takes a little while. Make my brush a bit smaller if I need to get these little bits just in here. Um, you can also use the, the little, um, I don't know what this one's called, the stamp, the clone stamp, I think it is, where you can clone. So I'm putting this bit here over here, and already that look, looking much better. And then I'd just make my coloring in tool a lot bigger and just do pick a color like in here and just do big wash over so it starts to even out. There's another dust spot over there. Look at that naughty, get rid of that. So that's looking a bit better. There's still some color discrepancies down here and this is light and then goes to dark. So I'd you know, work on that a bit more um, and get it up to looking like this. Um, then what I'd do, these little bits of blow out here, there's no detail in here. So you can probably use the tool I've got now, the clone tool, lower the opacity. I might grab this bit of fur here and just gently kind of color in a little bit over here. So you can't see the pattern repeated, but it's just taken out that glare. And even down here, you maybe put a little bit of this in and see how it looks like it's straight away that didn't work. It's a weird, I'll zoom in nice and close to you guys. It's zoomed um, in, it's a different color and, and you know, you can tell that that's not the proper fur. So I might have to use some of this stuff and just try and go in there a bit. Um, sometimes I find using a bigger brush makes it easier because it's, you know, let's grab this bit and match that over there. That looks a bit better at lower opacity, 50%. Let's go even lower. Let's do 25%, 26. Just to take the little bits of shine, select that, get, put it on there, select that, put it on there. Just to kind of even it out a bit. Now, so now there aren't any bits that are drawing my eye away because there's nothing too glary. It needs a bit more work, but you kind of get the idea. Even then, you know, a couple of minutes, that would be done. Maybe I'll get the clone tool and I'll just make it really small 
and I'll go over the shadows just to darken them. I like, like to emphasize the nose, a little shadow crease in here, and maybe the shadow underneath where it's laying on the ground. Beautiful, and maybe that shadow. There you go, nice and easy. And finally, I'll just show you this one. This is a flamingo walking in the water. Um, there's some dust spots on here, I'll get rid of those straight away. Um, this one needs a bit more work because this is actually the quick edit version. Um, I'll show you the original version. I'll just get on the right tool. Anyway, I'm just going to get rid of these dust spots because they bother me. Okay, so the original of this looks like this. Firstly, the color's off, so I'm going to crop it because I want to crop out some of this stuff at the top. So I'm going to crop and make sure it's nice and straight. I want some of these concentric circles in here at the back, and I want to make sure this distance and this distance are pretty much the same. So maybe about there. Okay, great. Now the green, it draws my eye away. If I was judging this, even that bothers me. If you ever want to know if anything looks weird in an image, flip it upside down, and then we're not looking at it with our normal, you know, per parallel and perpendicular eye, and stuff stands out. So again, for this one, I'd probably get, this is the coloring in tool over here. It's at 20% opacity. I'd select this gray and just start to color over here. So I'm actually coloring this in lighter. Select and color. And just keep kind of coloring. You can see it, the green is going and it's changing to pale gray. I don't want to go over the bird. And I also don't want to take out all the detail in there because I want it to look still like rippled water a bit. Even that, pretty much there. And that was a pretty messy background. Other than the dust spots. And I'll zoom in to show you what they look like close up. They're very bad. This lens got really dirty. There's some down there. These little things um, here and down here. They're little grey dots that people often miss because we're not, not necessarily looking for them. That are uh, specks of dust on our lens when we change lenses. And they're pretty, even though we have self-cleaning sensors, they're on the lens or they're on our sensor. Um, but there's a heap of them. So I get rid of all those. And sometimes you've got to zoom in really big like this to find them. But there's another one hiding just there that when I zoomed out. So I'm selecting this and putting it over top. Select that, put it over there. I'm going to go through and make sure there's none on the flamingo itself. And that's pretty good. I might even go in and take out the feathers on the beak. And if I might, don't really like the feathers on the beak, make my clone tool really small, and then be able to take those out just by you know, grabbing this bit here and putting it over there. This bit here, put it over there. Really making sure you can't see you've done it. And then even smaller, just to do this little bit on the edge. Select the gray and put the gray along here. Oops, not like that. <laughs> and if I do anything wrong, I just undo. I go back and I do it again. I actually have a pen on this computer that I can use. Right now I'm using a mouse, it makes it a bit harder. So again, no, let's try again. Got to have a really steady hand. because You can make it bigger. It's easier if you're doing it big. You can just go in and get rid of that little white feather edge. Really carefully. Um, not quite there, but you get the idea. So now the feather's gone. I don't like that dip in the beak now. I think it looks weird. So I'll go back in and I might grab this bit here and just bring it straight down as a straight edge. I clone that in, there you go. And then clone that in and work with it so it has that nice smooth curve and it takes out the bit where the feather was. And then again, go to my contrast tool, my burn tool and burn in, oops, too much, what's it on? 100%, no, you only want 10%. Yeah, and just burn in some of these shadows without going out the lines, just to you know darken some of these little bits. And that's it. That ends up looking like that. I've also um, darkened it a little bit as well by look of it. So I've gone into my um, curves, and I've just you know you can darken or lighten your image. So that's kind of the simple sort of editing I do. It's taking out a leaf. You know, if a kangaroo is laying on the ground and there's leaves near its paws. I'll go up to the kangaroo and, start, and actually talk to them, uh, remembering they understand everything we say. And I'll just say, oh, sorry, I'm just removing these leaves because they're in my photo. And I just move them. And they just, you know, when you talk to them, you're putting them at ease. You know, they're, they're understanding that you're coming up and you're doing something. And I just move the leaves out the way, you know, and they're super happy and they stay there. And then it's less photoshopping later. I'll flick poop out the way, kangaroo poop if I have to, you know, or I'll move to a different angle so I can get as much of a clear background when I'm shooting as I can, as I'm thinking about that and doing it. So like I said, we're planning a much longer session of this where I'll go through about 10 to 12 photos and you know just show you how I'd bring it up to where I want it to be from what it was originally. And in all honesty, every photo I take gets a little tweak like this. Normally the contrast and a bit of a crop, but sometimes I get too excited and everything's on an angle and I've got to go and fix it. But they're literally the tools I use just like that. I don't do anything more than that. 
um, very rarely swap heads or do anything like that. So I take so many pictures, I've got a great range to go through to pick the one that I want. This guy, at one point, a lizard swam past this bird, one of those marine iguanas. This is in the Galapagos. And we're at the beach, and our, our guide just said, go over that hill and, you know, just go over the hill and you'll see, um, you know, some flamingos in a, in a water feature thing, like a natural lake. I was like, what? And we walked over and there's some flamingos and there's lizards swimming around. It was like, I thought I was in the twilight zone. You know, uh, there's other pictures where I'd like the pose of the legs in this one. There's a hundred photos of this bird walking, but it's legs with both one in front of the other or side by side. And I like the angle of this and the, and the whole reflection. Sometimes I was chopping off the head in the reflection as I was taking the shot. That's why I chose this picture. So I'm just going to screen share back to my end of my PowerPoint for you. Go down here and we're up to... Um, we're going to do any questions. I'll jump on those in a sec. I can see some in the chat there. And there you go. These are some of the pictures that all got a bit of an edit from the Galapagos. Everything gets a bit of a tweak just to bring it up. This uh, bird here with the chest puffed out, that's a little red pouch, uh, frigate bird. This background had all sticks and stuff in it and I just used that um, coloring in tool and I just blended all out. This, this brown color was in there and I just blended all out all around. Same here and with the sky, you know, I've used that on some of these um, and a little crap. Any questions? And I'll just put up my details in case you want to find me. Um, there's my website, my Facebook page. There's also the Inspire with Alex Kearns Facebook page. And you can find me at blackcatconsulting.com.au as well if you want to check out anything in there. Uh, I'll bring back up the Facebook slide just as we go over the questions so you can have a squeeze at that. There you go. Okay. Sorry. Tomorrow or whenever you're free next. So I'd like to say thank you, Alex, again for this great session. We hope everyone has enjoyed it so far and learned lots. Uh, thank you for taking your time out to join us, um, you know, in the morning, in the evening, in the afternoon. This session was also recorded, as I mentioned, and will be available tomorrow. I'll be sending out the email with all the details where you can rewatch the session again. Now, if you'd like to get your hands on one or view a demo of our photographer range of monitors, you can vi visit our specialized resellers in the following states. Uh, let me just share my screen. Yeah, mine. Stop mine for you. There you go. Can you all see that? Yes. Can you see that, Alex? Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So we've got um, Camera Electronic in Western Australia. We've got Video Pro in Queensland, George's Camera, Camera House in New South Wales, Specular as well. Specular is also um, available in Victoria and New South Wales, and also Image Science. And those of you who are in New Zealand, we've got Computer Lounge. Now, if your questions were not answered, feel free to contact us from the email that I'll be sending out tomorrow and we'll endeavor to provide a response to you as early as possible. Now, don't forget to help us fill out our quick survey and provide your feedback on what you would like to see for the next webinar. Alex, any final words? Uh, no, what I might do is I've just cut and pasted the questions. If I can, I might even um, just sometime between now and next week, just do a quick video answer of those and send it through to BenQ. Um, or put it in my Insta stories or something so people can jump on there and, and get some of those answers. Or feel free to email me as well if you've got any questions um, about BenQ monitors, animal photography, coaching, anything like that. Just um, always here, just, or lens, lenses, what lenses to use, anything like that. Just reach out and I'm always happy to help. Thank you, Alex. Thanks so much. Thanks for your lovely right, Thanks, guys. See ya. See ya.